Yeah. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Georgetown. It is great to be with you on this beautiful morning, a good morning. We're thankful that you're here. My name is Alan, and I have the joy of being one of the pastors here. Um, Friends, today we finish our three-week look at this book of Ephesians, and we're going to look at Ephesians 3 and invite ourselves to continue to imagine this relationship that God wants to have with us, with the church. So let's pray. God, we thank you for all that we've celebrated today, and we praise you because of it. Not ourselves, not our own efforts, but the work of your spirit through this place, through us. We pray that more have heard about your love, the more have understood your love, and it's been an honor to be able to share that and do our very best. We pray for this message that what we have put in notes might become something that comes from you and that it might enter into our hearts and our minds that we might more clearly understand what it means for you to be with us and to love us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All of you have perfect church attendance and that's wonderful, but just in case you don't have perfect church attendance, This is the third week we're looking at the book of Ephesians. In the first week, we talked about how God has chosen you. Remember, we talked about that playground experience and wondering if we've been chosen. And we claim that you have been chosen. Not only have you been chosen, but you've been lavished with grace. More than you can even imagine. More than you even need. You've been lavished with grace. Last week, we talked about how Christ breaks down walls and Christ breaks down barriers and how Paul is claiming this new unity in the body of Christ, which is to include both Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus, which to us is like, ah, oh, that's old Bible stuff, but To say at that time that Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus were one and the same was incredibly radical and new defining for these people. Today in Ephesians 3, the reading begins by saying, for this reason, because of all of these things, Paul is going to say, I pray for you. And here, my church, is what I pray for you. And then he offers another long sentence. Karen, great job this morning, thank you. Um, He offers another long sentence that has a lot of beautiful, deep words. And today, I would summarize it quickly by saying, to know the love of Christ beyond knowledge. Paul's prayer for the church is that we might comprehend the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge. Verse 18 says, to comprehend the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And those of us are thinking, that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction. His prayer is that you would know something that's beyond knowing. I hope that you can get this into your mind that you can't get into your mind. So Paul is introducing a difference between knowing about something and knowing something. He says, church, I don't want you to know about Christ. I want you to know Christ. So let's spend some time today looking into that difference between knowing about something and knowing something. Pick an event or an experience. Pick any event or any experience, probably one that's kind of uh, extreme, kind of something that may not happen all that often. I've come up with a very quick list, and my list is kind of extreme. I may have walked up, (laughs) the side of the bed I woke up on, it may have been a little wild when I wrote this. So, Think of an event or something extreme like snow skiing. Okay, that's easy. And then I wrote car accident. Ooh, think about a car accident. Think about jumping out of a plane. I know lots of you have done that here. 
Uh, musicians, think about being in the middle of an orchestra, being part of an experience in an orchestra. Here's another hard one. How about having a heart attack? Okay, this is where I'm going. Think of something kind of extreme, an event or an experience. You can read about that experience. You can go online and learn what it's like to do those things. You can have someone tell you about that experience. Well, it's kind of like this, and then it happens this way. You can set aside time each day to think about that experience. But until you experience it, you simply know about it. It's these experiences where we are trying to explain to someone what we did or what we saw. I saw the tallest tree in the world. And then you end by just kind of giving up and saying, well, you just had to be there, right? That's an experience. That's an event. I'm also thinking about people. Think about someone, anyone that you may know, maybe someone that's uh, famous, maybe someone that other people may not know. Today I'm thinking about Jim Connor. right? Pick anyone. You can hear stories about him. There's a lot of stories. We're saving them. August 25th, y'all come. Uh, someone can tell you what Jim Connor looks like, and someone can tell you what he wears. I've gotten a pretty good idea what Jim Connor wears, you know? Um, you can read his resume. You can, you can read the churches that he's pastored and, and the committees that he's served on and the things that he's done. You can listen to his jokes. Right? But until you build a relationship with Jim Connor, you simply know about Jim. Paul is saying there's something in experiencing, there's something in building relationships where I want you to know Christ. Today, if Paul were to write this letter to our church, he might say something like, you can go to church every Sunday. You can attend all four disciple Bible studies. Do you know there's four of them? Some of y'all are gonna do them all, it's pretty cool. You can give beyond a tithe to your church every month. You can sign up for every possible event. You can do food for every possible event you've been asked to do food. You can sign up for everything. You know your way around that QR code. But even then, it is still possible only to know about Christ. C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, Screw Tape Letters, a classic uh, it's talking about kind of a senior devil teaching a junior level devil. I like how that rhymed. I kept that in my notes. He's trying to teach him how to frustrate his client the best. And part of C.S. Lewis's point in the screw tape level letters is that the devil knows more about God than we do. The devil has all the scriptures memorized. The devil knows more about God than we do. And so there's a difference between knowing about or knowing. Paul's prayer says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is encouraging you to know Christ beyond knowing about Christ. So how do we do this? How do we experience this? How do we 
take that step. Maybe it has something to do with what Paul is saying in verse 17. He uses this word, dwell. He says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your heart. Dwell. Dwell to live as a resident, to remain in a place for some time. I pray that Christ may dwell in your heart. Karen Chikoian, who is a commentator that you can find in Jim's amazing commentaries that he has called Feasting on the Word, which may or may not have moved from his office into my office this past week. (laughs) She shares about a way to think about what it means to dwell and ask Christ to dwell in your heart. And what she says is that there is a difference between a house guest and someone that has moved into your house. What does it mean for Christ to dwell in your life, in your house, if you will? She says it's the difference between a house guest and someone new moving into your house. So let's think that through. We've had house guests before. You've had house guests before. When house guests are coming over, you prepare your house and you clean it up. You don't want people to know how you really live. And so you hide the things of you. You might take some things and close some doors of the rooms that are messy. You might take some things that are out and you might put them in the garage so that they don't think that that's where the dirty clothes go all the time. In our house, we're, we're water drinkers in our house. And we have these bottles, you know, everybody's carrying around these water bottles these days. We might have like 12 of them laying around in our kitchen at all times, waiting for somebody to get around to clean them up, right? And so when we get ready for guests, I'm gonna get a box. I'm just gonna put all those bottles in the box. I'm gonna take that box to the garage for a few days. That's where it's gonna live. I want anyone to know that that's how I live, which is why I've said it in my sermon just now. When you have house guests, um, you, you prepare, and when they arrive, there's a certain level of hospitality that you show them. There are certain manners that you use. And no matter who the guest is, if they're a good guest or a, a bad guest, or if they're a fun guest, or if they're a difficult guest, you know the whole time that you can get by with this just for the duration of this visit. Only a few more hours, or, or maybe just a couple more days. I can get through this. Things. The thing with the house guest is that you know that when they leave, things are going back to the way they were. As soon as they leave, we're gonna go out to the garage and we're gonna get the laundry and put it back on the steps where it's supposed to go. It's gonna go back to the way things were. That's a house guest. We've all had house guests. Not all of us have had new people living in our house. Have you had a new person that moved into your house? There's a lot of different ways this can happen. Maybe a second marriage. Uh, Many of us in our congregations have had a, a second marriage and there's a moment where the partner's children are gonna live with your children and suddenly it's a new family and, and it's a new people moving in to your house. Or maybe you have had a season where your mother or your father came back to live with you in your house. Maybe you've experienced bringing in a newborn baby into your house. That's bringing in someone new. It's an entirely different dynamic from a house guest. Bringing in someone that's gonna be there with you for the duration. There might be a season of hospitality. There might be a season of manners where we try for just a little bit. But friends, there's going to come a time when this new person that's in your house is gonna look in the garage and see the junk. There's gonna be a moment where that new person is gonna open that bedroom door where you store all of your stuff. They're gonna see what's going on and 
eventually their entering your house is going to change things. There's gonna be something about your life that changes because this person is living in your house. You might be on a new schedule. The joke this week at my house, because it's not a joke, is that I do laundry on Friday mornings. My day off is Friday. I do laundry on Friday mornings. It's the first thing I do when I wake up. Don't get me out of that habit. Don't get me out of my schedule. And one of my boys tried to cut in line and do a load of laundry, that, and he learned. You don't, you don't do that. Um, new diets, the things in our fridge start changing. If some of these new people in our house are teenagers, there's new odors all over our home and new places. Here's the thing, you suddenly realize, you suddenly realize that this isn't your house anymore. that it's a shared house. And so Paul says, I pray Christ may dwell in your heart so that you may know the love of Christ beyond knowledge. Paul says, I want Christ to move into your house. And I want Christ to change things about your life. I don't want you to give Christ the guest house out back so that you can keep going about your business in your main house. I don't want you to give Christ a little bit of space underneath the stairs. So, but I want Christ to be able to, to come and dwell and to live. And it's gonna change you. And in that you will know. And it's hard and it's impossible to explain what this feels like. It's the same thing with an experience or a person. I can tell you about it, you can read about it, but until you really start to live it and experience it, until you really have Christ come and dwell and live in your heart, it, it's something you know about instead of something that you know. Maybe that's why Paul uses the word mystery several times in Ephesians 3. Paul is like saying, you, you can try to figure it out in your head, but you're just not gonna get there. Because what we're talking about is more. It's a mystery. It has something to do with your house becoming Christ's house. So that you may be filled with the fullness of God. There's an African Methodist Episcopal pastor, Mason Parks, and he adds to this conversation. He says, the more you get into God, the more God will get into you. And then Paul ends with a doxology. And he says, you can't imagine how much this is going to change your life. You can try to imagine it. You can try to figure it out. You can try to lay out your goals and your plans. But God's gonna surprise you because God's gonna do more than you can even imagine. God's gonna change your life in ways that you can't even imagine. So open the door. Open the door. The message version of this doxology at the end of the scripture today says this. God can do anything, you know. Far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. Friends, I invite you to know Christ, to allow Christ to dwell within you. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.